by wonderful Joy Meadows, the president of PWN Vienna and the founder of the Leadership Explorer. Aside from sharing her invaluable ex expertise, Joy is will have a very special announcement that we'd like to share with you at the end of the session. So please stay tuned till the end. Um, a few housekeeping details before we get started. You know how to participate in today's event. At any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions to today's presenter. To do so, just type your question into the chat. And as time allows, Joy will address as many questions as she can, but I think she prefers to save them all till the end. Um, this is also when we will share a announcement that could benefit you, so make sure you stay tuned till the end. We'll be recording this webinar and we'll share the link after the event together with a copy of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to now give the word to Joy. Enjoy the presentation. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lydia, and thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's a true honor and a privilege to be here today, uh, and on, not only in the capacity of, of, a need, of a leadership expert, but also in the capacity of the, one of the two presidents of PWN in Vienna, because as we said at the end, we will going to announce something together, something very special that is going to benefit many of you. So when it comes to today, um, I have tried to put together something that will benefit you, something that might help you get you where you would like to be. At the same time, I realized that this is a topic that I could talk about for maybe a whole month and trying to put it together into 45 minutes was not that easy. Or maybe was that just that overachiever in me that always puts her best in everything she does. Let's see at that later on. Maybe this is something that you can think about as well. So when it comes to today, let me just introduce myself very quickly. And as you can see here on the slide, uh, I have so many titles and so on. And this is not what I really want to talk about to you today. I have taken many steps or in the corporate career that I had before, I am still, I'm gonna say, successful in what I do, but this is not what I want you to know about me. What I want you to know about me is the following. I really believe that I'm an explorer at heart. The reason for that is that whatever I do and whatever I have ever done, and I hope that whatever I will do in my life, being an explorer, it's my drive. It's what really gets me out every day, exploring anything from nature to cities, to people to, you know, it's that curiosity that really keeps me going. Second is that leadership is really my passion. And I found out recently that the first business book I ever read was on leadership, I have forgotten about it, and I was only 14 years old. So it has started at a very young age, and it didn't stop. And also the third thing is that I call myself a development geek. It's never enough. I can always do better. I always look for ways. How can I grow? How can I develop? How can I change something? And this is something that I really hope will never stop, because the day we stop learning, I believe, we are not alive anymore, so I really hope to stay a development geek. You might be here today because, you know, you have been working hard your whole career, but it has only brought you so far, right? Or maybe because you're doing everything in your power to make everyone around you happy and fulfill everyone's expectations, but then they are telling you, well, you can't make any decisions. Like, why are you trying to make us happy? Or, you know, you are not being really seen as the person that can go to the next level because this is your communication is not right or you can't talk to the senior stakeholders or maybe they are saying you oh you're overly critical you're always the one in the team who pinpoints always what is going wrong well i can tell you those are stories that i hear on a daily basis from people that come to me that i help and those are stories that we all can somehow relate to and you know if you can if you're wondering of how you can get out of your own way well 
this is the right place. I really hope I can help you in that. And I really want you to get the most out of it. If you have any questions in between, please write them in the chat. I will answer them at the end. There will be time for a Q&A. Other than that, enjoy. And uh, I really hope I am going to say that I do not disappoint you. Well, that would be the old me would have always said, I hope I don't disappoint people. Nowadays, I'm like, I know what I'm worth and I know what I bring to the table. And you will see why I'm saying that in a few seconds. So before we get into the behaviors and into the whole thing about what got you here won't get you there, I think it's really important to give you a little bit of context. So I'm gonna start with an introduction about how behaviors are being formed. You might see here on the pictures, the beautiful iceberg, right? And what we usually see from an iceberg is just the upper part. What we don't see, it's the whole bottom that goes in. And this is the same when it comes to human beings. What we usually see is the behavior. It's the way we behave. But what we don't realize is there is much more to the person and this is everything that's deep inside ourselves. Those are our thoughts, our values, our emotions, our feelings, our belief system, our priorities, everything. And if we go even, even, even deeper, you know, there are our needs. And if you have heard of Maslow, this might be about self-esteem, about being worthy, being loved, you know, wanting to belong, the feeling of safety, security. So actually, if you look at the behaviors, everything what is underneath the water, right, everything what you don't see, it's what actually drives the way we behave every day in every situation. And that's really something important to re realize and to know because we will come back to that in a little bit. And there is one more thing that it's also driving our behaviors. It's the environment we are in. So what you might see that in one organization, you might be behaving a certain way and in another organization in a different way. And this is something that you know, it's also important to realize that depending on the environment where we are in, our priorities might change, our thoughts might change, also our needs, because they might be instantly met and we might be behaving in a different way. But then, you know, how do we actually, I'm going to say, develop all this belief system? How do we develop our emotions and so on? I like to call this that we create our own internal world, right? So the world within. How do we do that? So when we are kids, right, when we are young, very often it is up to our parents, but also to the people that are close to us that are responsible for satisfying our basic needs, right? And what happens is that very often some of those basic needs are not fulfilled. So what happens then, because they are so unmet, we develop certain schemas, you know, or ways of how we deal with things. And from those schemas, actually, that, you know, there are some beliefs in there, there are some emotions and so on, we will develop certain survival strategies. And let's be honest, we all had different childhood right and it's not that it had to be always something really bad happening to us but sometimes you know even you know not enough love is okay but maybe too much love was also not okay or we had an experience you know at school that really shaped us and this is how we have then developed a survival strategy what the survival strategy does is that it actually it teaches us that whenever we are triggered or we feel unsafe, that we act and react in a certain way, right? It's, it's like an autopilot. And let's be honest, for certain things that is okay because you know we have to react so many things in a day. But when it comes to leadership, if we are reacting out of our survival strategies, if we are acting on autopilot, this is never a good thing. But what the survival strategy does, it gives us a short-term relief, right? We are immediately relieved and we have a short-term gain. The problem is that 
that, you know, when we approach those different situations, what we always try to do is to further strengthen our own schemas, even as adults, right? And then those schemas are so embedded deep down inside of us that actually, you know, those belief systems are constantly being, I'm going to say, we believe them more and more. So when we then try to give up a certain belief system, it feels like we are giving up part of ourselves, part of who we are and part of our security. So what's important is that on a long run, we really need to become very aware of those things because they are driving us. And when they are driving us this way, they are not always helpful because on a long term, when we always react out from survival strategies, we have a long-term liability. So let's have a look at the three survival strategies that we have. It's the so-called fight, flight, and befriend. So when we are in the fight, uh, it's something when we are overcompensating about something, right? It's about trying to be controlled. It's about tricking someone and so on. When we are in the flight one, it's about, you know, we, I'm resigning. So I will just do what everyone else does, right? And we have all been in this situation. And when we are in a befriend, it is actually when we are trying to, you know, no, sorry, I just mixed it up. So a flight, sorry. It's like, I don't let anyone close to me, right? When we really try to be very far away where we are not emotionally attached, where we don't let people get to know us. And the befriend or the freeze, it's actually when we resign, right? Where we just say, I will do what everyone else does. Let me tell you a story. If I look at my childhood, and it's not that, you know, it has been the worst of the childhood or something like that. But I can clearly see how I have developed, especially the fight survival strategies, but also partially the flight and the befriend. So the fight was, I always wanted my mom to actually be proud of me. Well, I was always the first in class, always trying to do my best. And she never said, I'm proud of you. So I was always trying to do more and more and be better and so on. And it never happened. The flight one, it's, it's so funny, but we were always told in the house, you don't cry in front of other people. So don't show your emotions, right? So go to your room. So this is something where I learned that whenever I'm having a bad time, I don't ask for help, but I become emotionally unavailable till I solve my own issue. And the befriend, the complying is, I so much wanted to be liked in school. Oh my God, I was trying to do anything just to be liked. So it's, you know, we all have this. And, you know, I think what's important about it, it's really to be aware because those strategies that we have developed through the childhood, but also through later experiences and the people we have met, they are following us in adulthood and they are still driving us, right? And what I always like to say is that we all walk around with an armor around ourselves. It's like a shield, right? Because we are dealing with threats in our environment. They might be real threats or just perceived as such, right? And we often perceive things that are not true. We might feel that we are in danger or that our identity is in danger and it is not. So actually, we all have a certain armor in front of us. So what I would like you to do next is to take some time. I hope you have maybe something to write. If not, just do it in your mind. I'm not going to put you in breakout rooms because I think this is a very personal thing. And as you don't really know each other, I don't want you to share this with other people. But take some time and really think of the three following questions. What is my armor made of? When did I acquire my armor? And how do I show up when I'm fully armored up? And I know those are difficult questions, so I would be very happy if you take them later on at home as well to reflect. But just for the sake of today, take some time and really think about what would you ask answer to those questions. What is my armor made of? When did I acquire my armor? And how do I show up when I'm fully armored up?
And those are maybe for some of you easy questions, for some of you not, but we all have it. And I know that when I'm fully armored up, well, I might not be always the nicest of persons, right? Because first of all, I'm gonna detach myself so people will not really see me. And the second, I might be in an overachieving mode where I go like a bulldozer and don't, and I see somebody smiling. So somebody might be even having the same thought. So just take some time and reflect for yourself. Joy, there's a question if they should share in the chat. If you feel like sharing in the chat, please do so. I would be very happy to hear. Don't feel obliged because I know those are very personal things. So however you feel, if you feel like it, please do so. Would be happy to read. Let me see if I can access the chat as well. Maybe there is also someone who would like to go live and share, up to you. Yeah, it's very personal, right? It's so difficult to share in a group like that. I totally get it. This is about vulnerability. It's something I had to learn the hard way to really owning my story, owning who I was, who I have become and being able to share what was happening and how I got to where I did. Okay, I see somebody writing fully armored up means I'm very controlling. Yeah, you might get into micromanagement. Yeah. I see Victoria is trying to say something, but you are muted, Victoria. I can share. Um, so, so yeah, it takes, as you said, it takes a lot of work on, on oneself to, to discover, to go deep and look deep into our deepest yearnings and longings. And um, my armor, my armor, yeah, uh, was made of distracting. So I wouldn't exist. Everything else would exist and I would just joke around when, when, a, when a situation will come that is pressing or that is stressful or that is, yeah. And, um, and I would just start joking around everything. So it's like, pretend that nothing exists. Yeah, so like nothing is happening, right? Yeah. So yeah. yeah, so if we can joke around things that it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And I did acquire it when I was very young. I grew up with, um, with um, a violent father. Um, and um, and I acquired it then because that was my survival strategy, how to survive. Because when the, when the situation would tense up uh, and I would feel that violence is coming my way, I would start joking. And I knew that this is a strategy that will save me in that situation so that I can can release the tension. Um, and um, how do I show up when I'm fully armored up? Yeah, I'm joking. <laughs> this, is, this is it. <laughs> it's the sarcasm. It's a coping strategy. Yeah, yes. it's a coping strategy. Yeah. It's so. okay. Victoria, thank you for sharing. Thank you for opening up in front of all of us. I'm, I'm going to say almost an applause from the whole group for opening up in front of such a big group. So kudos to you and to your vulnerability. And I see in the chat, many people have also actually shared, right, that you get overly defensive or you defend yourself or you pretend that it didn't hurt or you become detached or you get very critical, judgmental. 
yes, we all have all those kind of things. Perfect. Thank you all for sharing. And as I said, this is very personal. So keep it for yourself. But it's something important to be aware of because those things really drive us. And, you know, if you want to develop, if you want to go to certain levels of career and leadership, you know, you will need to start dropping that armor down more and more. Because the problem with the armor, it's also the following. You have a helmet. When you have a helmet, you don't really see what the reality is. So it's always good to make a reality check as well. Is the threat I'm really perceiving really a threat? How true is it in the moment? Just something for you for actually, you know, uh, I'm going to say think about it. Good. Then I would like to go to the second part of today. Oh, actually, I have one more slide um, that I forgot that I added in. Work in progress. Because... I really and fully believe that we are all a work in progress. You know, we grew, the way, you know, we are born and then we are growing up and we become adults. There will always be things, you know, that we can do better, that we can do differently and so on. So wherever you are on your phase of development right now, it's okay. You know, it's your story. So own your story. Don't compare yourself to other people, right? It's not necessary. Wherever you are, it's okay. The question I would ask myself is, who do I want to be next, right? And I'm not saying in five years or 10 years or 20 Next, what's the one little thing I can change or improve, you know, that will make my life and the life of the people around me easier? And that's it. So who do I want to be next? Just a question for you to reflect. Good. So if we go further, I would like to share with you even more when it, about conscious leadership. So this was just the introduction. The reason I talk about conscious leadership is because I really believe that if we are leading people, we need to be extremely conscious of the impact we have on others. But to have that consciousness, I think we first need to be conscious about ourselves. So increasing our self-awareness and really, I'm going to say learning to self-lead, right? Because there is a question I usually ask many leaders is, if you are unable to lead yourself, should you even be allowed to lead other people? And this is a question that gets a lot of, woo, you know, in the room and so on. But it's a good one. So it's about increasing your own consciousness in order to contribute to this world and to be the leader that the world needs today. I'm going to just speak to you for a few seconds about the leadership circle profile. I have only two slides about it. This is a 360 assessment that I really love and use. The reason I'm introducing this here is because one of you today will actually, or all of you, if you are in a leadership position, you will be able to apply to actually win one leadership circle profile assessment with me with a debrief, but I'm going to give you more details about it later. This is how it looks like, and I'm going to explain more. And what's important about it is why I love working with it and why actually, you know, if you are working as a coach, I always say it takes away six months of coaching just because it's so comprehensive. It gives such a great picture about what's going on, why it's going on, and really it gives you a pathway for development, right? Actually, I call it a developmental can opener. I'm not joking. I really, it's like a Pandora box, right? So many things come, come clear and you start opening it up and the more you open, the more things you realize. And it's a life-changing tool that many people love. So, and I'm going to speak to you about it in a bit. So when it comes to your career, career and the way we need to grow. I like to call this our growth edge. So what happens is that we have, you know, we talked about before our inner world, right? So what's happening, our beliefs and so on. Sometimes we call this also the inner operating system. And our inner operating system needs to adapt or evolve and so on, depends 
on the world where we are in. And, you know, with the complexity that we see in the world nowadays, you know, VUCA, it's already, we are all in VUCA times 100, but with everything happening, the complexity is getting bigger and bigger. So also our inner operating system, the way, you know, we think, the way we feel, the, you know, the things we believe and so on, needs to upgrade it. I like to call it, can you imagine, you know, I have an iPhone, for example, right? So can you imagine running the apps that you're running on the iPhone on an old Nokia that we all had 20 years ago? It doesn't work, right? It's the same, you know, with ourselves, like as human. If we want to deal with the world and with the complexity out there, we need to evolve our system as well. The reason I'm showing you this is because the leadership circle talks about two structures of mind. So what usually happens is that when we feel stress, we unwin behaviors learned from years ago or decades. And those are, you know, our survival strategies. We operate in this kind of autopilot mode, but not only when we are stressed, when we are under pressure, it's the same thing. And this is when our emotions control our behavior. And this is where our emotions control us. They own us, right? And usually when later on we evaluate the situation, we find out that we have not behaved optimally. Well, actually, we might have behaved poorly. And these behaviors in the leadership circle I called reactive tendencies, right? We are in a reactive mode because reactive behaviors are completely natural. So there is nothing wrong with it. Don't get me wrong. There is nothing wrong with it. It's just the way people are. It's just the way we are. The problem is that those reactive behaviors are not usually useful when it comes to leadership. Because when we are in a reactive behavior pattern, what we do, there is usually a problem or a threat. And then deep inside, there is a fear coming up. We might fear for our safety or for our identity, or, you know, because of it, we might, you know, our worthiness might be under question. And this is when we react to something. And you know, problem solved. So we have, again, a short-term gain. On a long term, this becomes a very energy-draining behavior or very energy-draining pattern that is really not helping us. So a question that you can ask yourself in different situations is, am I reacting to something because if you're just reacting to something if you're in the autopilot it means that you are in this reactive tendencies in the reactive strategies this is where your survival strategies are coming up right or am i acting upon something which is you know when you are acting upon things you have a purpose and a vision in mind you actually this vision brings up passion, you get into action, it's an energy giving thing, and you are creating different outcomes. And this is the kind of behaviors that leadership needs today. And those are the kind of behaviors that the leaders of the future, not only of today, but of the future need. So we all need to go through this developmental stage. What's important is that if we are in the reactive, a part of us will always stare there. Even I, let me give you an example. This morning I had an appointment and I took the wrong tram. I took the tram one instead of 71, right? And I was immediately like, oh my God, why did I do that? You know, and uh, I was thinking of myself, oh, again, I did a mistake, right? And that was the controlling part of me who says, no, 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 you're not allowed to fail, right? You cannot be late. You have to be perfect. You have to be there on time, right? Well, very quickly, I caught myself into that reactive behavior of saying, you can't be late, you know, you have to be perfect and so on. And then I was like, you know what? It's okay. 
I still have enough time. It's not that bad. I might be a minute or two late, right? And this is where it, I went immediately out of the reactive. And this is important for all of us. So remember the question, am I acting upon or am I reacting to? And I really hope that most of your days you're acting upon things. But remember that whenever you're stressed, whenever you're under pressure, whenever you have deadlines coming in or with everything happening in the world, it's so easy to go back to our, you know, known place, to the safety, you know, to the comfort zone. And those are usually the reactive tendencies that we have. Okay, bear with me. There is lots more to come. When it comes to the reactive character structure, there are three ways that I already explained before. So whenever we are in the reactive, what it means, we might, you know, flight, freeze of befriend, right? What I told you before. So what it happens is that whenever we get trapped in our reactive tendencies, our ego really demonstrates the need to control the outcomes. This is in the controlling part or to keep us away from vulnerability. You know, this is the protecting part or to make us give power away to be liked and accepted. There is a gift in this reactive land, but when it is overplayed, it becomes our enemy rather than our ally. And this is where I'm going to tell you a little bit more about. But what's important is that whenever in the reactive, we are trying to, I'm going to say, we are trying to fulfill certain needs, right? So if we go into the complying, well, we want to be loved. Remember I said I want you to be liked at school, you know, we try to meet other people's expectations, you know, we try to please others, we just wanna be accepted. So we do everything, you know, just to be loved, to be accepted and so on. When we are in the protective mode, we, you know, try to be right, we try to be superior, we even get very distant. So I know from time to time, I was trying to be right and I know that. and. You know, something funny happened a few days ago, a situation where somebody asked me something and my first, you know, you know, the autopilot was, how the hell does this person ask me this thing? Doesn't he or she know it? You know, it was really like, I was so critical, but also, you know, I felt superior, like he should know it. And the old me would have then later on sent to the person a lot of information proving that I was right and that this person should know that and this person was wrong. The new me was very like, okay, well, maybe there is a reason this person doesn't know this. Maybe just there was a confusion, didn't realize or something like that. And I didn't do anything about it. And this is, you know, the more creative way. So I acted upon, I didn't succumb to my autopilot. But I can tell you the first second, I was totally in the, you know, protecting part. I was in my survival strategy, like, I cannot tell you how much, right? And the same it is with controlling. When we're in the controlling one, we, you know, we try to be number one, we try to be perfect, you know, to excel, to win, to dominate and so on. So actually what we do is when we are in the complying, we are moving towards people. So we actually, we give our power away. When we are in the protecting, we are moving away. So we are really distancing ourselves from others. And when we are in the controlling, we are moving against someone, right? So it's like getting into the fight and that's important. And just for you to know, we all have these roots in the reactive, right? I love it, this picture, because this is also where the origin of our gifts lies, right? But our developmental task is to grow something on top of those roots, right? To have the gifts, the gifts, the strengths that we greet, that we bring, really flower in a way that serves the world. And this is what I want to help you with. So, um, okay, maybe just a little pause before we go there. How are we on questions in the chat? It seems all good. Mm -hmm. 
no I know I'm so far. Okay, I know I'm dumping a lot of information on you. So, oh, is complying good? Ha, ah, Catherine, that's a very good question. That's a very, very good question. I'm going to answer this question in the next few slides. So it's not about bad or good or wrong or right, right? It's all about seeing where, oops, just a second. Something happened on my screen. Okay, here you are all back. It's about knowing where we are, raising the awareness, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit more. So, Katrin, do I assume you're in the complying? Do I assume that correctly? It, no, it was only I was a little confused because all the things next to it, love and stuff, seemed like positive things, and the others didn't. So I was confused because I... Yeah, I, I was assuming what you said the second time, but it just wasn't really clear. Okay, good. It's a lot of information, I'm aware. So if we go back, if you look at this, you know, when you are complying, or maybe let me go to the next two slides, then you will see. So because I will go through the three different ones in a second. Okay, so let's start with complying, right? So what happens with complying when we are complying? I would say this feels that we are losing our identity. We are losing oneself. We are giving our power away because we are trying to meet other people's expectations. I call this also the Mother Teresa syndrome because what we do, we might, uh, I'm going to say, consciously manage, you know, uh, to really be or stay in good graces of others. We might always try to do good by everyone. You know, we might try, you know, we so often might say yes, even though we really want to say no. You know, in meetings, we would really try to see, oh, my God, you know, is it safe to speak up? You know, and before taking any action, we might be double checking authorities and so on. So what we want to do, we want to be loved by others, but we want to be loved by others and accepted in a way that we really give our power away. So, Catherine, what do you say? Is this good or bad? Ah, so now I understand the small words is what you're trying to get by the outside behavior. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So you're trying to get acceptance, you know, you're trying to please other people and so on. The problem with this is that usually if you are constantly in a complying mode, you don't, uh, I'm going to say, you might not make decisions. You're trying to make everyone happy. Your boundaries are not clear. Uh, you know, people don't know what where you really stand because you might not have an opinion about certain things. Also, you are the one always taking care of everyone. You might not be standing up for yourself and so on and so on. So there are many things that actually do not help you in your own development, but not that only don't help you, they don't help your team as well, because if you're doing the work instead of your team, you know, because you want to protect them because you want to be liked, Actually, this doesn't really help. And if you're a leader, if you cannot make up your mind, it also doesn't help. So, but there are gifts here, and we are going to come to that in a bit. Then let me go. Joy, Joy yes. Matea's hand is up. Okay, Matea. Yes, I would just like to do it really quickly. I yes. don't know if you see me. Do you see me? Yes, I do. Hi. Okay, uh, I just want to say this complying is maybe a bit dangerous because I was doing that uh, in my first two jobs because I was insecure in my experience and I was afraid I will be fired. So I just complied with everything what everyone said. And I think it was really dangerous because people use that and they start to transfer their negative energy and emotions on me because they knew that I won't, uh, I will just comply. This is yeah. what I want to say. It can be really dangerous, I would say. Yeah, exactly. You. you have been then also very loyal to them, I suppose. Exactly. And, you know, and you were never challenging the status quo and you would never speak up and so on. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you for sharing, Matea. That's such a brilliant example. And, you know, I have a client currently who works in an environment that where speaking up your opinion is not advisable, right? Yes. It's costing the person so much energy that I think the person will quit sooner or later because he or she cannot deal with it anymore, right? Yeah. And, you know, I can mention. Yeah, and the person really doesn't like conflict either, right? So it's really getting uh, into, I'm going to say, uh, this complying tendency of not saying anything. And this comes from the experiences, you know, that he or she had already. And at the same time, you know, this is being, ex uh, you know, it's getting bigger and bigger. And it's, you know, he needs or she needs to get, I, I say he, but he or she, they need to get themselves, you know, out of this because on a long term, this is actually, I'm going to call it not only energy draining, but it can have health issues and so on popping up. Exactly. Yeah. Also, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing, Matea. Thank you for opening up. Thank you. Okay. Let's go then to the next one. And I would like to go to the protecting. So whenever you're in, in the protecting with your behavior, what you are trying to get is actually you also want to feel safe. You want to feel better than the rest. You want to feel, you know, superior. You also want to feel right. But actually what you're doing, you're staying safe or, you know, your own, you feel worth it by staying very distant. So you are never showing any emotions. Sometimes people that are highly in the protecting, they never show any vulnerability. Actually, a client of mine was always told to have a poker face because they never knew who or he or she was and what he or she was feeling and what he or she was thinking. It's like having this wall in front of us and we really distance ourselves because, you know, we want to feel self-sufficient. We want to feel right. And at the same time, what's happening is that, you know, we might be holding back and, you know, just watching. And I'm sure you know those people who are just watching unfolding situations. Also, what sometimes those people might do, they might be seeing always the flaws and the problems. They might be seen as the overly critical because they always come, you know, and they say, oh, you know, this is wrong, right? And I'm sure you see, you know, people like that. Or, you know, they even might be saying, how should I say that? You know, they want to be seen as, oh, I am better than you are, right? So whenever you say something, they will try to say something on top of it so that they will, you know, be seen as even better than the other person. So this is the protecting. I can tell you when people are in the protecting mode, there is a very wounded child, I'm going to say, inside. It's for all three, but even in the protecting even more, because, for example, I had a client who had to take care of the grandmother while the mother was away for work in a different country. And she really learned, this is a she, I'm going to uh, tell it, to actually be self-sufficient, that she could never show any weakness, you know, that she could be, I'm going to say, you know, being capable of dealing with anything very independent and so on and was never asking for help. And this is also not healthy if it's overdone. Clear about the protecting? Okay, I hope so. If not, uh, Lydia, you will tell me. And then I would like to show you the controlling. Oh, the controlling one. Well, I'm partially here. I mean, years ago, I was on all three Nowadays, I still know I'm partially in the controlling. I know that it's part of me and I own it. So, you know, this is where we really set high standards for ourselves, but also for others. This is where, you know, it's never enough, where we get very competitive, where we try to outperform, you know, where we always want more, you know, and this is also when we are in the controlling, you know, a micromanager, well, a micromanager, it's usually in the controlling uh, uh, behavior as well, in the controlling tendency. 
And this is where, you know, failure is not possible. I remember at one of my first jobs, the first time that I was leading, do you know what was my favorite word to say? This is not acceptable. Oh my God, when I think about it right now, I'm like, oh, what an idiot, sorry for the word, I was at the time, but I was so much having high standards for everyone around me and myself that this was my favorite word to say, this is not, not acceptable. And I can tell you, we can all get away from it because when we are in the controlling, you know, we try to achieve things, we try to dominate, we try to win, we try to be number one. So, um, you know, what we don't realize that when we are in the controlling, I call this the bulldozer, right? So we go like a bulldozer in front and we leave dead bodies behind. We forget about the people. We don't have time about building relationship. Let me give you an example. Um, I had a person coming to me and she was always told that she will never make it to the board of the company because she's not capable of properly communicating with different stakeholders. Well, I can tell you it was not not about communication at all. It's never about communication, by the way. What was the problem was that she wanted to be, I'm going to say, very active. She thought that building relationships and talking to people and, you know, doing the small chat and so on meant losing time that she could spend on acting on other things. So you can imagine the person, you would get into the meeting and you would go, hi, how are you? And she was like, okay, let's go to the agenda, right? So very abrupt and so on. And this is what she was told. And at the end, it was more about her controlling than actually the whole communication around it. Okay, so let's do a very small reflection for you. So where do you see yourself the most? So do you think you're more in the complying, in the protecting, controlling? And would the people around you say the same or something different? Let's see. And feel free to write in the chat. Where are you? Are you more complying, controlling, protecting? Okay, Lydia controlling. Woohoo! Welcome to the club. <laughs> what about the rest? Where do you see yourself? Protecting and controlling. Uh, I'm in that club too. Okay, Stephanie, controlling, complying. Okay. Controlling used to be complying. Controlling, protecting. Okay. Controlling followed by protecting, controlling, and a little bit of complying. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And honestly, it's okay. We are all in the same club, right? We are all there. It's how we grew up. It's how we develop. And those are the reactive tendencies that we all have. It's all good. But there is a secret. And do you want to know what the secret is? Or actually some good news? There are quite some nice gifts in those reactive tendencies. There are things that you're really, really good at, you're just using them the wrong way. So you will need to ask yourself the question, what do I need to unlearn? Because we all will need to unlearn something. Do you wanna know what the gifts are in those different? Yeah, because there are things you're really good at and you're not aware because you're using them the wrong way and then they have the wrong impact on the people around you. So let me share with you the gifts. Oh, I'm not giving you gifts, I'm just sharing gifts, right? So just saying, perfect. So if we look at the complying, right? Actually, if you are in the complying, your gifts are the following you might be really good at recognizing and responding to the needs of others. You might be very reliable. You might be sensing other people's emotions more than others. You might be willing to go the extra mile. You know, you might be really good at maintaining loyalty. So you're loyal to people, to, you know, organizations, to causes. 
You might be even the one who is upholding traditions, which is something very important. You might be, you know, being in service of other and being easy to talk to. But I really believe that the biggest gifts in the reactive is your, uh, in the complying, it's your ability to in fact build relationships because there are so many seeds in here in what's written in the gifts that you know you know how to actually develop people you know how to be a team player you know how to be a servant leadership and so on you're just using it the wrong way let's then have a look at the gifts in the protecting Ooh. so Actually, the people who are usually in the protecting, they are really good at cutting through complexity and really seeing the issues, you know, they, they are so able to get this, I'm going to say, bird view, right, you know, the balcony view. Also, you know, you are capable of getting detached and observant and not getting too emotional when things are getting emotional. And this is also something that is often very needed. You also, you know, you do care deeply for certain people or certain causes because there is this wounded part of yourself that actually really, really cares deeply for others. And, you know, you have such an extreme knowledge that you can offer the problem is that you know you have this knowledge and if you you know constantly putting down onto people it will not help you so when you're in the protective i think what really is important for you to know that the gifts are it's the wisdom that you have it's your ability to remain detached when things get emotional and also, you know, so which it means that you can bring in, you know, that harmony that is needed because somebody needs to keep a cool head when, you know, things are getting too hot, I'm going to call it. And, you know, don't forget that, you know, you see so many issues that others might not see. At the same time, if at every meeting you just point on those issues, you will be seen critical. And this is not what you want. You need to actually provide a vision of why is this important. You need to communicate it in a different way. So those are the gifts in the protecting. Do you think controlling has some gifts? Because I saw we are so many controllers and so on. Yeah, of course, there are some gifts in the controlling as well. So. Um, well, you know, I said at the beginning, I'm a development geek, right? Well, one of the gifts in the controlling is our wish to pursue continuous improvement. And, you know, not only in our personal lives, but also at work and in everything we do. Also, we do excel in many situations, so we might be really good at different things. We are setting high standards, which for some people might be good, but for some people might not. So we have to be aware of that. One colleague of mine years ago told me, like, Joy, I know you're used to at giving 200%, but remember that most people will give only 70 and that's okay. So I really had to, you know, step down. Also, when you're in the controlling, you do create results and don't people know it, right? So you're really good at that. The problem is if, if you keep creating results, you know, will people really want to get you to a higher leadership position? You're the doer. You're constantly in action. That's something you need to think of because the higher you get, the less results you create because it's your people who are creating those results and you need different things. Also, you might be really good at influencing others. The question is, how do you do it? Another thing, you're speaking your opinion, even if it is controversial, so you're not afraid of doing that and you're taking charge and getting into action. So those are all the gifts, but remember, you know, when you're in the controlling, protecting or complying, you know, we are then using our gifts the wrong way. So I think what's here important, it's to really, I call it making the unconscious conscious. It's to really shine a light 
on the underlying thinking patterns that we might have, you know, that really drive our cur current behavior, because this way we will really have different access to new choices and possibilities. It's really important to be, I'm gonna say, aware of our tendencies of what is driving us, because when we will see that, we will be able to uncover our gifts. And when we uncover our gifts and strengths and we start using them, you know, in the right way, using them in a way that we act upon something, this is when people will perceive us completely differently. How does this sound? Any comments? Otherwise, I go for the what's next and last part. OK, I see a heart. Then that means at least somebody is listening in. That's good. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, so what's next? OK. Oh, what's next? That's a very good question. You know, people, when people come to me, they say, so how can I get to the next leadership level and so on? Or how can I improve? Well, there is no magic stick. There is no magic formula where from one day to the other, you will be different. Because we know that change is hard and we all have to make an effort. We have to make an effort if we want to change, if we want to do something differently. So what I have prepared on the next two slides is a set of questions that I believe you need to take away. So feel free to take a picture of the next two slides and really reflect on those. So, and the questions are the following. First of all, have a good look into the mirror I know we don't like that, especially women. Oh my God, nowadays even more because constantly looking into you know, the videos and so on. And be really honest with yourself and answer the question, what do I see? But be really, really honest with yourself. And when I say, what do I see? It can be anything, you know, about your strengths, weaknesses, you know, physical, emotional, whatever it is write the answer to what do I see? Then go back to what we discussed at the beginning about increasing your awareness around your survival strategy and armor and really become aware of when and how, you know, did this armor come to place? And it might be even in different situations through life. And what does it mean? And then start looking at ways, how can I build it down, right? Then become aware of your strengths. And to do that, it's like you can think of things like when working at your highest and best, what impact do others say you have? Become aware of your impact, but also of your strengths. What are you good at? And then the question, what behavior, if changed, would make the biggest difference for you and your environment? Really think of that. What would make the biggest difference for you and your environment? For me, you know, I said at the beginning, I'm an overachiever. I'm still working on it. And I know I have to kind of still scale it down a little bit, right? I think this is what will make the biggest difference because sometimes 110%, it's more than enough. 120, it's already too much, right? So that's one. Did you take a picture of the slide? Because this is your homework. And then the next slide with more questions. Then start observing yourself in action and ask yourself the question, am I consciously acting upon or unconsciously reacting to something? And this is really to become aware, am I in all my reacting tendencies? Or am I using my gifts in the right way and I'm acting upon? Because when we are in the reacting, it's energy draining. When we are acting upon, it's energy giving. Just remember that energy draining, energy giving. And also, what's the impact of that behavior that you have identified before? What impact does it have on the people? And then let's go a little bit deeper which assumptions and beliefs am I holding firm when behaving this way? So the behavior above. Then I would like you to challenge these assumptions and beliefs. Really, 
How true is that? Are those beliefs really serving me? When did this happen? When did I learn this belief and so on? And in order to, I'm going to say, lead differently or behave differently, ask yourself, which new assumptions do I need instead? And of course, at the end, you can contact me for more because this is about developmental coaching and uh, you never know if we might be working together. And having said that, those are my contact details. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you do so, please do write in a private message that you have been on my CU session. I don't accept usually um, uh, requests from people that don't write anything because usually they try to sell me something. So that's my way of doing it. Or you can contact me via email. Those are my two emails. And here I'm open to questions and answers. It's been a lot, I know. So give me thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. How was the session? How much did you learn? Okay, I see, I'm seeing some thumbs up, some hearts, okay. Joy, you're amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Lydia. <laughs> all the hearts, all of them. Okay, so questions, tell me. What questions do you have after all of this? And don't well, I, go away um, because we have two special announcements still coming. That's right. So I've written down two from the chat that were unanswered. Yeah. I'll um, read out one of them. Can we separate ourselves from these roots? That was the slide with the tree. Or even further, how can we turn these roots into something powerful and positive, more balanced? Yeah. Okay. I love the questions because can we separate ourselves from the roots? Do you want to separate yourself from your own roots? That's a question to ask yourself because if you separate yourself from your own roots, you're cutting yourself in half, right? I, so when it comes to the roots, I always say it's not about separating yourself from the roots but really understanding your roots, understanding what has been happening, increasing awareness around it. Because once you do that, you will be able to deal with everything in a completely different way. So don't separate yourself, own your roots, right? Own your story because your roots, it's what made you who you are today. You know, I always say my childhood, it has been whatever it has been, but without my childhood and all the experiences, I would not be who I am. So it's a crucial part of you. Of course, it still defines us in certain way. What's important, it's finding the way in which way we want to, uh, that it's defining us. And if we see, you know, I have a quote, I think, on my website, see yourself as a piece of art. If you see something that you don't like, get to work and change it. It's the same with our roots. Is there something that we are not proud of, that we have a part of ourselves? Well, get to work, change it, right? You can do that. But don't, you know, deny your roots. They have made you who you are today. There's another one in the chat. How does status sensitivity, wish for acknowledgement, respect, etc., correlate with the three types outlined? Oh, okay. Status sensitivity. Well, when we are very sensitive for status, so when we have this huge need to be respected and acknowledged and so on, this is when we very much get into the complying and protecting uh, uh, tendencies, right? So because when we try to be uh, acknowledged um, or actually sometimes even in the controlling because we might try to overdo something, you know, because we want to be seen, right? So we are trying to make ourselves even bigger because we want the people to see how, you know, good we are and so on. So uh, it, it does impact the way we behave. It totally does. And... Again, we all have that, right? In different, I'm gonna say, for me, it may be this, for somebody it might be such big of a need and so on. The, the issue is being really aware of it and catching yourself in that moment and then doing it differently. 
Okay. Any more questions? As I said, go through the questions that I have given you and feel free to contact me afterwards. I'm really curious to see what, uh, what the outcome will be. Uh, Maya, your hand is up. Uh, yes, uh, there is one more question. Uh, actually, patients ask that she feels she's in a protecting mood and feels like it's affecting her relationship. So how should she go about it? Oh, yes. Okay. So whenever you're in a protecting mode, it's going to affect all of your relationships, personal, professional, and so on. Um, okay. This is a longer conversation. So let me give you just some, let me give you an example. Uh, I work with a leader still today, already actually for a one year, who was extremely high in the protecting and distant, right? And it was affecting all of her relationships as well. So what we did uh, with her is we started with her showing just little parts of herself, right? Sharing herself a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, like doing little steps, being vulnerable, maybe sharing an emotion, maybe sharing what she did on the weekend and so on. So slowly, you know, showing who she is, what she feels, what she thinks and so on, so that people really get to know her. And I can say it takes time, right? So whoever asked those, this question, it's, um, so I am not having too much time uh, actually off this, but I can maybe take two or three people who are interested to have a 20 minutes talk with me separately on a certain note. So feel free to then send me a private message and we can have a look at that.